Electronic Age. In this edition, women and minorities. What are their opportunities with the new technology? Also, software for girls. Will a departure from rough and rumble attract girls to computing? Later, the Mood Channel, from fish bowls to fireplaces or whatever turns you on. And a story about cops using lasers to lift prints and solve crimes. All this and more in this edition of the New Tech Times. The New Tech Times is brought to you through a grant from Wausau Insurance Companies. Times change. Wausau works. And by the collective voice of the consumer electronics industry, CEG, the Consumer Electronics Group, Electronic Industries Association. I'm Nicholas Johnson, and welcome to this edition of the New Tech Times. One of the most interesting aspects of the new technology to me is how people react to it, how they actually use it or fear it. This week, we look at how women have reacted to computers and how many women have learned to take advantage of computer knowledge to break new ground in corporate America. We begin with this report from Northern California, where women are finding out the computer can provide upward mobility. Okay. Does the computer do anything by itself? No. Fear of the computer, or at least an apprehension about it, among women and minority students at San Francisco State University was the impetus for a new course offering a few years back. Called Computers Without Fear, this introductory mathematics course is tailored to students who've had little opportunity to relate to computers in the past. Right, exactly. Line mm -hmm. one. Wait, I'm at 600 right now, so... Okay, so let, let, let me equal... Okay, let's be equal. Dr. Diane Rizek, a math professor who founded the course, calls it a vital catch-up tool for women and minorities who want to go on to professional careers in computer fields. Well, we started realizing that large number of students weren't succeeding in the regular computer science courses, and there are about five around campus, and the problems seem to be the same. And it was over half that weren't making it, and a lot of them were women and minorities. So we became concerned and thought, is there some way that we could create a course that would get them ready for it? Our campus, I don't think, is that different from many others. It's very hard to get on a computer, and you have to wait in line, and you have to be rather aggressive. Make sure you get your turn. And also, it's very hard to get help, and that's another place where you have to be aggressive. So you've got to have kind of uh, confidence in yourself to start with. To, to ask for attention. And I think very often we see that women and minorities don't have that kind of belief in themselves. Dr. Riesig and instructor Robert Poling say the course has been well received by the students it serves. More than 300 sign up each year, and in its five-year run, attendance has been a strong 95%. The course has opened new doors for minorities, and particularly women, because it teaches more than how to punch the right buttons on a computer. Someone needs to be a risk taker, needs to experiment, needs to play around. And that takes a certain amount of confidence. And it can be very scary. And that exploration is certainly one of the things that this course focuses on, is getting students to play with the machine. Many women are finding out there is life after computer courses. In fact, some suggest women are finding even better opportunities in the computer industries and the world of electronics. What Lynn and I came here today because we were interested in knowing what's going on with the trade show scene, and we had some ideas for what we wanted to do. June Bauer found life and livelihood in the computer world. She's not a graduate of the San Francisco State course, but has a good middle management job at Apple Computer in the software division. And she reports great opportunities in the field for everyone, including women. I think what's happening in the computer industry is that, that there are many women in computers and many women in high positions that is in, in management type positions compared to other industries because I think once you get in once you overcome that barrier of you know computers being technical and maybe women not thinking it's appropriate or being afraid or whatever um, once you get into the industry there's tremendous opportunities like many in these new tech times June Bauer sees the computer as a tool and wants other women to see it that way as well so June lectures in workshop settings about them, advises women who seek her counsel about computers, and most recently has co-authored a book designed to help women's computer confidence. 
June feels there are many obstacles for women to overcome in order to find success in the computer world, most obvious, the way in which women are taught as they grow up. Part of it is the way we're brought up. I know I wasn't brought up to, you know, fix a car. I wasn't brought up to do anything that was technical at all. And a, a reverse example I like to use is that I have a friend who's a male who had problems with his pants. They needed hemming. <laughs> and he said, gee, you know, would you hem these pants for me? And I said, um, well, I'm going to teach you how to hem them. And so we sat down, and I, I thought, you know, using a needle and thread is very simple. Sat him down to do it, and it took him an hour to do one pant leg. And he was tremendously frustrated by it and said, I'm just going to take these to a tailor unless you do the other pant leg. But, you know, for me, sewing is very simple. I've been brought up to sew and know how to do it easily. He was totally intimidated by it. He was afraid. What was he doing with a needle? Were the stitches too big, too small? So I think that, you know, women have have experienced something similar but more relative to technology than to things like sewing or cooking or whatever. You have to think for a minute about why someone might have trouble using a needle and thread or why someone might have trouble introducing themselves to a computer. And I think a lot of it has to do with, um, you know, not intelligence or um, what you're particularly good at, but your attitude. And if you have an attitude that you can't do it or your attitude you're afraid of it, or it's meaningless or you know you don't like it to begin with it's going to make it really hard for you to take the steps to really initiate yourself to a computer and so what the book is trying to do is to say how do you feel about these things what's your attitude about them let's let's discover a little bit about ourselves first and then from there let's go on to learn about computers June Bauer is but one of many women in the computer and electronic world she says those who can overcome early life experiences and fear of the new technology will find vast rewards. What I really like is the working as a team and making things happen. So that means working with the people that work with me, you know, on my team, software team, and then our team working with our hardware team and our whole team working with the rest of the company and the company working, you know, against the competitors and with our customers. Uh, that whole process of what happens and how we make things happen, that's what really interests me. And I also had originally wanted to be a teacher and found that was just going to be like a dead-end kind of career. And what I like here is, is working as a teacher, that is, as a manager with other people and teaching them what I know and also learning from them. Whatever TV may be doing to our children, parents, teachers, and friends still have enormous influence. And in these new tech times, there seems to be a growing effort to combat sexism in our schools, churches, and society. As we researched the issue of women in computers, we found a group of people in Richmond, Virginia, who are working to provide non-sexist software for little girls a counterpart to many of the games that have emerged with violent or masculine themes. It's another example of how women are taking advantage of the computer. Here's Gary Probst's report. Video games, they provide action, adventure, and the first contact with the computer world for millions of youngsters. Most of the games involve violence, the shooting down of aliens and objects. It's a rush to score points and win. It's no coincidence that the heaviest use of computerized video games is from boys and young men. There's a female psychologist who claims that video games are one reason many girls are behind the boys when it comes to computer knowledge. She feels that the whole high-tech industry is geared towards men. I mean, obviously, girls have been brought up different than boys, and they have different kinds of things that they like to do. Um, but as far as the whole presentation of computers and software in the whole industry, rarely do you ever see a competent, attractive-looking woman as some serious part of a computer ad. That's really not what part of the presentation of a computer is. Even the new IBM is called the Junior, which is a male name. You know, I mean, that, that's the kind of thing that goes throughout the industry is that these subtle little indicators that computers are really something for the guys. And then most people get introduced to computers by games, and the games are the video, sprinting, speed, high points type games, which are fairly meaningless to most women. Stott decided to do something about it. In order to fill the video void, she's developed a software company for girls. The company is called Rhiannon. It's just starting to expand beyond the basement of Stott's home in Richmond, Virginia. Rhiannon's software programs are designed to help girls learn about computers through survival stories. One of the programs is Jenny of the Prairie. 
It's about a pioneer girl separated from her wagon train. The players of the game help Jenny to cope with nature. Pressing the right button will produce food, water, or the ability to avoid the danger of wild animals. Go down. Go on, Jenny, go. <laughs> Come on, Jenny, you can do it. Jenny, you can do it. Come on, Jenny, you can do it. Come on, Jenny, you can do it. Jenny, you can get dead. Okay, you better get out. Go down. Jenny, go down. Wait till the... Other programs include a story about a girl on a South Sea island and a girl who lives in the wooded wilderness. There will soon be a program about a girl living in the 25th century. What we're doing is providing a game that's intriguing so that they'll spend a lot of time using the computer and they do a lot of problem solving. Girls like it when they have a whole array of goals and they can choose which ones they want to try and solve first, second, third, in what order, part of this one, part of that one. It's more like weaving an intricate pattern to reach your goal and less like just sprinting as hard as you can to get there fast, which is what boys like to do more. Sissy. It's, she'd probably think it's sissy. Boys would think this is sissy. Why is that? Well, because that usually boys like more action than going. Stott says boys enjoy playing her games, but they tend to make it a contest of who can move the figure through the screen at the most rapid pace. The girls tend to take their time, trying to devise new ways for the figures to survive. Stott believes that software for girls is a market that has yet to be tapped. Some of the large computer firms told her there's no interest in her product. Stott's having a difficult time finding stores willing to put the programs on the shelf. But she's confident that her company will take off in a big way. I think it's going to snowball pretty much because everywhere we've gone, we've gotten just tremendous enthusiastic response from kids and from their parents and also from a lot of teachers who are saying, this is the first time I've seen a program I can really teach with. This one isn't mundane. It's interesting. It's the kind of thing I can encourage kids to explore and learn new things with. But Stott didn't go into the business just for profit. Her main goal is to put both sexes on equal footing during the electronic age. Well, some people will say, why can't girls play the same games as boys? Which they could, uh, but it's not that they can't, it's that they find it uninteresting so that they don't want to be bothered. That's not where they'd rather spend their time. Boys are different than girls, and we enjoy that, and we like them to be that way. And when it comes to computers, Computers can be used in lots of different ways that would appeal to girls as well as ways that would appeal to boys. If you have story ideas or comments, send them to the New Tech Times, 821 University Avenue, Madison, Wisconsin, 53706. Or just call the source or CompuServe. Last week, you met a student of human reaction to technology, Dr. Stanford Weinberg, a researcher at St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia. Dr. Weinberg is back with us this week. Talk some more about cyberphobia, especially women's fears of computers. Dr. Weinberg, welcome back to New Tech Times. Thank you. We, uh, many of us assume that women have a greater problem with computers than men. Uh, for starters, do you think that's true? I think some adult women may. I think that uh, when adult women were in high school or earlier, when they were 10, 20, 30 years ago, they were told that it was appropriate to go into things that were people-oriented rather than technologically oriented. And that's why so many ended up in, in jobs that are relatively low-paying and are obviously jobs related to people-oriented skills. But I think today those same skills that were once very people-oriented become computer-oriented. Nurses are using computers, secretaries, uh, bookkeepers. And that makes it very difficult for someone who was told that they would be dealing not with machines, but with people. And I think that develops a kind of a fear. But I've seen first, second graders where there's no difference between boys and girls. And I think the next generation won't have that kind of a problem. Well, do you think then that there is any need for special software designed for girls rather than boys, for special training courses uh, for women? I think perhaps training courses might be designed that would be designed specifically oriented to the kinds of things that a woman might be doing. And I think certainly that some kinds of training courses might be sensitive to women's kinds of needs. But I think special software probably isn't necessary. There's a lot of software out that is not very well organized and not very clear, and I think that should be clear for everyone, males and females. But I don't think that's specifically a women's issue. 
What are some of the other things that have, that have made this a problem? I mean, why have, why have we had these assumptions about uh, women's inability to deal with computers? Uh, I think there's a tie to math anxiety. I think back in, in seventh, eighth grade, girls are kind of discouraged from doing well in skills like mathematical skills, and they're discouraged by very subtle kinds of peer pressures. Computers are seen as being mathematically oriented, and I think therefore girls tend to shy away from those kinds of skills. We found that in college, though, that there are as many female as male majors in computer fields, and they do just as well with no kinds of problems. I don't think there's any kind of a, a mental difference that makes any kind of an, an impact at all. With the math anxiety, does it make any difference if the computer is first seen as a word processor, something that involves literary endeavor rather than mathematics? I think that that might make it easier. I haven't seen that kind of a research study, but it may be easier if computers are seen as being non-mathematical at first. But at least you don't see any inherent problem, that, that uh, the congenital problem that no. women should have with computers. I think the next generation, the generation now getting comfortable using computers in the first, second, third grade, we're not going to see any big difference between males and females. Now, you've researched this problem generally, uh, Dr. Weinberg. What, what advice do you have for us, men and women alike, as, as to how to deal with this problem of anxiety that you've said affects 30% of the population? I think one of the basic things is to have reasonable expectations, to know what you want a computer to do, to be willing to spend the money that it might cost to get something that does that well, if indeed it's worth getting, and that once you have those expectations, then to realize you're not going to be more effective or more productive with a computer right away going to have to learn how to use that a little bit. And once you do, then that productivity will increase. I think if those expectations are reasonable, then you'll find the computer does what you want to do and won't cause the kind of anxiety that might be so serious. And do you have advice for companies in this regard? I think that one good piece of advice for any company is to design a computer specific to needs of the people they're trying to sell to. And to make sure that they emphasize those kinds of things computers can do and who they're going to really help. I think if you look instead at engineering companies that simply try and design the most elaborate systems, those are appropriate for some kinds of markets, but not the home person. The home person needs to have very specific applications emphasized. Dr. Weinberg, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, computers have helped women advance in society. Lasers, we're finding out, are making advances in medicine, manufacturing, communications. Now, as we're about to see, they're also helping police collect clues in criminal investigations. It's a whole new ball game for forensic technicians as they go out to gather fingerprints. Here's a report on cops and lasers. Lasers. They're high-intensity light beams produced by a coil of magnets wrapped around a glass tube. When the tube is filled with gas and high voltage is applied, there's a reaction of ions forming that eerie glow. Sometimes laser light can help people see things they normally can't find, such as the case for the Sheriff's Department in Orange County, Florida. The laser allows us to scan large areas for fingerprints in a non-destructive, clean manner. It allows us to pick up fingerprints that could not be raised by conventional means. We have uh, lifted fingerprints from human skin, for instance, which is something which is not normally possible. We can lift them from substances uh, such as galvanized surfaces, certain plastics and papers, where they might not otherwise be able to be processed. Law enforcement people in Orange County need an edge in their fight against crime. The county's major city is Orlando, one of the fastest growing cities in the world. The population of the county, 300,000, and growing at a rate of 20,000 people each year. The crime rate has quadrupled due to the population explosion, but the police are starting to turn the tide on criminals through new developments in high tech. Officers use the laser to quickly scan over crime scenes wearing specialized goggles, which allow them to see fingerprints where traditional dusting methods would not have produced results. We're in the business of not only making arrests, but making convictions in court, and that has to be done with hard, unique evidence. Even a personal identification of a criminal can be questioned, but a fingerprint is truly unique. And if we can gather that fingerprint and link it to the defendant, we're going to win the case. A laser works better than dusting for prints because fingerprints are a combination of water and body acids. After a period of time, the water evaporates and there's nothing left for dust to adhere to. But the laser technology makes acids fluoresce. A video camera then records the image of the print and the tape is played back for the jury. If the tape is erased, crime scene technicians have the ability to retrieve the print months or years later with the laser. The new technology is now a routine tool for any major investigation in Orange County. Officers are finding it has the ability to help them gather other kinds of evidence as well.
I think its applications are potentially limitless. We have learned through utilization of it here locally that it's wonderful do for document identification. If you have an altered or forged document that has two kinds of ink, it'll show the difference where a naked eye wouldn't pick up a difference in color whatsoever. The laser will show it immediately in many cases. Uh, if you have a person who's been kidnapped, for instance, and a strand of human hair can be found in the vehicle that you suspect she was transported in or he was transported in, this laser will cause that strand of hair to brightly show up on the screen and you can find it with, I think, certainty and you can find it speedily. You can process a lot of vehicles in a hurry with it. Using a laser to fight crime in Orlando started in 1983, and already detectives say this new tool has led them to several suspects in pending murder investigations. I think that we're going to see more and more law enforcement agencies throughout the United States using crime detection lasers. Uh, we've been lucky enough to have some help here as a, in an area that has the leading edge of laser, laser technology uh, locally. Uh, but I think that as we have successes and other agencies have successes, it's going to become a standard tool. Uh, certainly, we have not found all the things you can use it for yet. And we think it's an exciting tool that's going to enable us to make more and more convictions. And today, especially with the average criminal being so interested in, in suing police agencies, what we don't need is false arrest suits. What we do need is convictions, and that's one way we can get crime down. One of my earliest interests as a youngster was writing a booklet on how to classify fingerprints. It's amazing to me to see the changes that technology has brought to the process of gathering them as evidence in the world of law enforcement. And speaking of changes, did you know the new technology now makes it possible to spend time in front of a blazing fire in your living room without having a fireplace or burning down your house? It does. Here's a look at some new Mood Channel video programs from our senior producer, Barry Stoner. There's a trend these days to make television programs fast-paced, with lots of cuts and lots of action. Producers use the technique to increase viewer excitement, or just to cram in as much information as possible. But one producer has come up with an alternative to all this flash and dazzle. This is Romantic Fireplace, a one-hour television program from Video Naturals. You can buy it on video cassette or find it on what's called the Mood Channel on some cable systems throughout the country. Let's take a closer look. That's right, what you see is what you get. One shot of a fireplace for one whole hour. The producer of this slow-paced program is Steve Saparin. And what struck me was that, well, with all this new technology, I mean, lots of people don't have fireplaces, especially in New York City, uh, in apartments. Now you could have a fireplace just for fun. Put it on, tell a friend, hey, come on over. Uh, we'll have drinks in front of the fireplace. And he'll say, well, you're crazy. You don't have one. But when he, when he comes over, you put on your, your videotape. Now, if you're not so keen on a TV fireplace, maybe you'd like one of the Mood Channel's other selections, like the aquarium. Or how about ocean waves? Maybe you'd like Pacific sunset. <laughs> or even mountain morning. If you're an art collector, you might be interested in Lumia lights, a video light sculpture. Like with anything, there are people who like it and people who don't like it. But the people who like it seem to use it a lot the fireplace there's one lady who told me that she just every night when she comes home she puts it on doesn't matter what the, this is someone living in california doesn't matter what the weather is it's her way of winding down now she may have a drink with it too i don't know about that but it people they they use it uh for fun just for relaxation the romantic fireplace may only be the beginning of what could become a booming industry for cable television one day there may be a whole channel dedicated to people at work at home with the program Video Traffic. No more cabin fever as armchair viewers enjoy the scenery that millions of commuters must face every workday. If the electronic fishbowl catches on, perhaps we'll see a whole series of programs called Video Pets. Share your home with a cute little puppy that never messes on the carpet and never chews your slipper. If you find it difficult to meet that someone special, you might be interested in Video Mates even if you're very shy, one day it may be possible to turn on that special someone with the punch of a button. 
Oh, hello, sweetheart. Did you have a nice day? I've spent the day making a wonderful meal for just the two of us. All of your favorite things. Now I want you to be careful about how much you eat. Because you have been putting on a few pounds lately. In fact, you may want to go upstairs and try to find something a little more comfortable to fit into. Though I don't think it's possible, considering you're bulging out of just about everything you own. And if she starts Did to talk back to you, on the way home? just hmm? shut her off. There's no end to what you may see on the tube, as producers try to fill up all those cable channels and all those video cassettes with programs. We've seen a lot of technological advances this week. Women's use of computers, non-sexist software, laser crime detection. It's an unpredictable world, our new tech times. I hope you'll be back with us again next week as we explore them together. For the New Tech Times staff, I'm Nicholas Johnson.